on the morning of the 22nd, we were, I had been watching the coverage the night before, and I've been watching the coverage of Love Field, and the, the crowds at Love Field were just enormous. And Kennedy, of course, started working the crowd the minute he got off the airplane. He got off the airplane, and I'm watching, and the Secret Service, you could see the consternation on the guy's face because Kennedy immediately left the guidelines and went to the fence where the people were and started shaking hands. You know, he was just a natural politician. And I got so enamored of his style. He had genuine, undeniable charisma. And I thought, I think I'll go over and you know, watch the motorcade. There was a lot of excitement in downtown Dallas. This was sort of like royalty visiting. Jackie normally did not make political trips, and so the fact that she was with him just really added to it. And there must have been two or 300,000 people in downtown Dallas. It was quite an event. So I was at the station about three blocks over, and at noontime decided to walk over and you know, see the motorcade. The guy uh, from the sales department as I was leaving he said, where are you going? I said, I think I'm going to go over and you know, watch a little bit of the motorcade. You want to go? And I started walking over, and I kept looking up at all of these building tops and all of these windows, and there were a lot of open windows. And I remember commenting, I wonder how they secure all of this. You actually commented on that. I, I did, and about a block away, I turned to my colleague and I said, you know, if there were going to be anything like an assassination attempt, it would be here. I don't know why I said that, because none of us really anticipated anything. We were, there, there, was, there was some tension because of the Adlai Stevenson visit, but it, it really that was the side. So I came over and stood essentially here, and you know, the motorcade came in. I didn't even notice John and Nellie in the front seat. I was just, just so it captured. Down, it came from this way, right? Motorcade came from this way, came down Elm, made that turn, came this block, and then turned right here, going very slowly about Oh, eight, I think the prescribed speed uh -huh. was eight miles an hour, 10 yeah. miles an hour. And I, as they passed, I, I was so captivated because Jackie looked, they, they looked like a first couple should. And Jackie had this little, you know, way, and Mr. Kennedy would brush the hair out of his face, and then he had this sort of wave, you know, and as they turned, I was, I think I took a couple of steps over and said something like, hey, welcome to Dallas, Mr. President. And they turned the corner and then, boom, you know, just, like, yeah, you know, they were. They have it marked off with X's, right? Uh, well, yeah, that's, no, X. that's the second shot and the third shot. The first shot, they were right about, you know, with the lamppost. And, it, you know, it, you hear it, and it was coming from straight in front and above, and, I, you know, your, your reaction is that that's not a shot. That doesn't happen in your hometown. That, that can, and I thought, well, if that's a firecracker, then boom, you know. It, then it was obvious what was happening. And I, I had glanced up on the first shot. The guys were hanging out of the fifth floor up there looking, you know, up. And to this day, I couldn't tell you if I saw the rifle barrel or not. But on the second shot, it was obvious that, pretty obvious that Kennedy had been hit but he didn't slump forward. His hand sort of went up, you know, like, like this to his chin, and he, he went a little bit that way, and Jackie was coming out of her seat and screaming, and then just in a matter of a split second, the third shot, and Kennedy then went back and forth, and Jackie, that's when Clint Hill, after the first shot, really, he ran forward and went over the left rear fender of the limo, and pushed the Kennedys down. And he was giving thumbs down to the guys in back, indicating it's bad. And he was screaming at the driver, go. And right after the third shot, Jackie had, was screaming, oh my God, they killed. It. She was she was actually, when, when Clint went over the left rear fender, she was up on the back. And it was erroneously reported that she was trying to get out of the car, and she was not. She was, she was really trying to repeat, retrieve that massive piece of skull that had blown off of, of, her, of, of her husband's head, and nobody knew that at the time. And then the car, right after the first shot, the limo paused momentarily and then took off, and the guys in the front seat turned around, and they were looking up and back. They were not looking at the ground, they weren't looking at the hill, they were looking up 
at the window and, you know, pointing like that. Peter Solomon was on the, uh, the streets of downtown right. Dallas as the motorcade passed through, and uh, you heard shots, did you it not? Happened, it happened pretty much in front of me, John. I didn't know that the president was dead until I came back to the newsroom. They wouldn't let us out of the Texas School Book Depository building. As the president turned the corner, we, uh, we were standing there and, and broke into a pause. As he, as he came around, uh, it, it, it's funny because we were, we were remarking among ourselves, Charlie Ford of Radio Promotion was with me, and we were looking up at the open windows of the Texas School Book Depository building and at all that open space and wondering just how in the world they had already covered all this and wondering where the Secret Service men were. And right after Mr. Kennedy passed in front of me, I heard one big explosion, and my immediate thought was, uh, like I think most of the people standing around there, this is firecrackers, but it's a pretty poor taste. I looked and saw the president, I thought, duck. Evidently, he was slumping at the time. The car immediately sped on. Uh, no one seemed galvanized into immediate action. The shots didn't seem rapid at all. They were three well-spaced, reverberating shots. How far were you from the car, Pierce, when the shots were fired? The car was in the middle of the street, and I was on the left-hand side of the street, I'd say about two. Ten feet. And it didn't stop? So. No, the car kept going. The car did not stop. Mm -hmm. The policeman immediately came over and said, uh, all right, hit the dirt. And everyone concerned scrambled right away, including this young man, that, uh, the young man with the two children, Bill Newman, whom I <coughs> talked to right after it happened. I, like uh, five or six rather foolish other people, immediately ran up the knoll over there by the viaduct and looked over the anyone. fence. We saw nobody except uh, a lot of people running around. And then I headed into the Texas School Book Depository where they were beginning to search. And well, did you think at that time that uh, the assassin had fired from the building? Yes, I think this was the consensus at the time, although now uh, I notice Mr. Newman says he felt the shots were fired from the knoll. No, I see. I think the logical place to have fired them would have been from the building, and then when I left a few minutes ago, they were still searching. The, I think the, the general reaction of the people over there as I left was, it just can't be. We have this uh, report that's perceived in the 57 Radio Newsroom that uh, Vice President Lyndon Johnson has left the Dallas hospital where President Kennedy died. Johnson was accompanied by his wife. Newsmen had no opportunity to question him. This report was issued at 1.48, which was just moments ago. And apparently the panelists closes the rumor that uh, the Vice President's physical condition was not in good shape. Apparently he is because Associated Press reports now that the Vice President of Johnson has left Parkland Hospital where President Kennedy died, accompanied by his wife, Lady Bird, and he spoke to no one as he left. Chris, uh, how many shots did, did you hear? You heard three shots. I heard three well-spaced shots. Do you think that uh, the shots were, were returned? Could it be that uh, the assassin fired one or two shots and possibly uh, one was fired in return, or do you think that all three came from the John, this, this, this is possible. However, the three I heard, I heard a, a boom, and then a space, and then another boom, and it was not until after the third the distinct sound, this third boom, that police were able to draw their revolvers and start uh, firing in return. And, of course, it was when they, they actually were reluctant to fire. I imagine there were a few shots exchanged. I don't remember, frankly, but... They were reluctant, probably, because of all the crowds around. The, everyone suddenly popped out with guns and told the public to hug the ground for safety's sake. Roger, Roger John, uh, we just got received word from Ron Ryland in the mobile unit that police have a suspect. They picked him up in the Texas theater. He has a gun. They are taking him to the main station now. And we are uh, calling uh, Ron Ryland for a report from WFA's mobile unit on that. Dallas police have taken into custody a white male found in the Texas theater. The man is believed to be a suspect in the recent shooting of a police officer at 10th and Crawford in Oak Cliff. A witness at the scene of the killing said that the police officer talked briefly with the young man, and the young man then shot the police officer twice through the head. After a furious search up and down Jefferson Avenue, the officers finally found the suspect that they have taken into custody in the Jefferson Theater, armed with a weapon. He is now en route to the Central Police Station. From the scene, this is Vic Robertson reporting for WFAA News. Well, apparently the assassin has been apprehended. 
We have no official confirmation of that, but apparently he was the one.